In this episode, President of STC, Aisha Moynia, discusses a society hitting the impressive milestone of 70 years old. She expands on whether she thinks members value membership as much today as they did 70 years ago. We further discuss how AI developments can affect the technical communicator role and whether Aisha believes AI and humans can exist in the same technical communication space. She explains what she thinks the qualities are needed to make a good technical communicator and feels that the role has an impressive future, as indeed it has had an impressive past. Welcome to this episode of Implementing Best Practice in Business. We're here to help you and your organization understand and implement global best practice to help you face the business challenges of today. Join me, Richard Farrow, CEO of APMG International, in talking to leaders and practitioners who have applied these frameworks and practices to boost their productivity. They're here, willing to share their knowledge and experience to help you learn from them so you can do the same to make you more competitive in today's market. My guest today is Aisha Moynia. Aisha is a veteran technical communicator with experience in a variety of corporate, non-profit and government settings. She currently serves as a communication vice president for a global financial services company where she provides consultation and support to the CIO and the technology organisation. She began her career as a technical writer and editor and over that time has held roles in corporate communications, public affairs and media relations. She's also done communications coaching and also consulting. Aisha is a long-term member of the Society for Technical Communication and currently serves as the organization's president. She's a member of the STC Sigma Tai Chi Honor Society. I hope I pronounced that correctly, Aisha, but you can correct me if I've got that wrong. And is an STC fellow and has served as an officer and council member for multiple STC communities as well as in elected and appointed leadership positions at the society level. Welcome, Aisha. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here today. And did I get the honor roll um, described correctly? Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, Sigma Tau Chi. Yes. Yeah, we have two um, honorary societies within the Society for Technical Communication. Um, the other is uh, Alpha Sigma. And, um, and those two designations represent um, graduates of um, like bachelor level and associate level programs. So I have to congratulate you. I mean, the society reaches 70 this year. Um, do you think the members value membership as much today as they would have done 70 years ago? Because there's a lot of sort of available advice and opportunities to engage online. So what do you think? Do you think it's better now, better then? Well, I definitely think that the idea have, of membership has evolved over time. Um, I have been a member of the society for more than 25 years. Um, I Today, I would not probably be considered your typical member. I joined when I was a student in a technical communication program. And really, the um, kind of the practice at that time was that you would join when you were a student or maybe when you were first getting into the profession. You would remain a member um, as you maybe got that first professional role or academic post, and you would stay with the society throughout your career and even into retirement. Um, today, we see that um, folks are joining us maybe more at transition points in their career, and they see that the society can help them develop and advance to the next level, um, but they aren't necessarily staying members, um, you know, for decades. Um, so, you know, a typical member may be a student who is finishing up a technical communication program and looking to find their first full-time permanent role um, or academic position. Um, they may be established uh, professionals who are looking to take it to the next level and advance in their career. They may be professionals from other fields who are looking to break into technical communication and are looking for some resources and support to be able to do that. So definitely that idea of membership has evolved over time. Um, I'm sure that it's not the same today as it was 70 years ago. 
And, and I can certainly relate to that. I mean, my, I originally trained as a civil engineer. So when I graduated, the only way you could keep up to date was to join the professional bodies. Because you know, if you weren't a member of the professional body, you couldn't get access to experts, expertise, um, presentations, conferences, and what have you. Whereas today, it's everywhere. So you know, I think you, like every professional body, you know, is, um, is going through that transition. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I will say in the past few years with the pandemic, um, certainly we have seen that you can connect with a community virtually. Um, much more easily maybe than people thought that they could or, or did before. Actually, I think that that creates opportunity for the society and other organizations um, because, you know, all of our programs are set up to be able to access virtually. And so if you're in the profession or if you're looking to break into the profession um, and you need assistance, you need resources, support, education, certification, we're here for you. Um, so, like I said, I think in some ways it's actually created more opportunity for uh, for STC. And and talking of opportunities and, and sort of developments, there's been a lot in the news lately about AI developments, in particular artificial intelligence and, and chat GPT. So what impact do you think these sorts of developments will have on the work technical communicators do? Can you see the technical communicator being replaced by an AI machine? Well, I will say that the recent media attention on chat GPT has really brought this question into a sharper focus. But the truth is that artificial intelligence and augmented intelligence systems and tools have been around for a long time. And so far, we are not seeing that the machines are pushing human technical communicators out of the way. Um, the way that technical communicators may do their job um, may change over time. What, what the, um, the AI tools are really great at is, you know, coming up maybe with a first draft of some content that, that will be grammatically correct, uh, but may not be completely accurate or factual. And so you still need a human to take a look at and quality check that material um, before, you know, publication or before posting. And if you think about, for example, uh, very complex technical instructions for a process that could have um, serious consequences for people or expensive machinery, if it's performed incorrectly, you don't necessarily want to leave that to the machines. You want a human, you know, to be involved in that process and to help make sure that it's accurate and correct. Um, on the other hand, those kinds of tools can be great for routine sort of automated processes, um, some customer service functions where, you know, you're re responding, you know, with kind of a set uh, response, you know, on a routine basis. Um, it's great to leave that to an automation system and free up your people to be focused on more complex, more strategic kinds of communications. So I, I think that you know, I and a lot of other people in the field believe that there is room for both um, and that, uh, you know, systems like chat GPT, other artificial and augmented intelligence platforms and tools don't necessarily mean that there's no longer going to be a need for humans involved in the process. You know, and and something else to think about is that there is a role for technical communicators to play in building the models and the databases that feed those systems. So in some ways, you know, they may create more opportunity for professionals. Yeah, and, and that's fascinating, isn't it, that we talk about artificial intelligence and the tools, and then we forget that behind them was a human that actually put things together to enable them to do it. I mean, that's a very, very valid point, often forgotten. Yeah, Right, right. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, we, we forget that sometimes. But, you know, I, I know a number of um, society members and, you know, other colleagues who do exactly that, you know, who work on those types of systems. And, you, you know, again, looking back 70 years ago, it wasn't something that we would even have conceived of. But, it, you know, it's a new area of opportunity today. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I know you, I know you can't sort of Transfer, transport yourself back to 70 years ago when the society started. But clearly, the world has changed, technology has changed. Do you think 
that it's more challenging now to explain technical information um, because it's more complex with the advancement of technology? Or do you think in those days, because technology and systems were more straightforward, explaining them would have been easier? So you, if you had a time machine, would you rather gone back 70 years and work in that technical environment, or would you rather live in the environment that we live in today? Well, I can't go back 70 years, but I can go back 25 years to when I started in, in the profession. And I will tell you that when I first started, uh, we didn't all have computers on our desktops. We didn't have laptops. I started, um, I did an internship um, at, a, at a national laboratory in the United States where uh, we didn't draft on computer. We hand wrote drafts on legal pads and then we turned them over to someone who would type it into the system and then would do some sort of layout. Um, I, I see you acknowledging, yeah, if you didn't do it yourself, then <clears throat> you're familiar with the concept. Um, I can't tell you the difference um, that it has made in my ability to do my job that, to be able to have more advanced technology um, in terms of the, the speed with which I can get my job done, the accuracy. Um, it, it's, uh, it, you know, there, there's just no comparison. So in some ways, that advanced technology has made it easier, faster to do our jobs. We can do it with more accuracy and efficiency. Um, you know, on, on the other hand, there are so many more kinds of technology and systems and platforms that need documentation. So in that way, I think it's also created a lot of opportunity. Yes, the technology is complex, uh, but it's the role of a technical communicator to help make it more understandable and usable for people who aren't experts. And so in that way, I think it, it creates more opportunity as well. I mean, that, that leads into a sort of an area for me that that I always like to think about, and that is, what are the personal attributes? What makes a good technical communicator? You know, what is the, there's never an ideal profile, but is it a, is it a blend of inquiry, curiosity, people skills, technical understanding? You know, how would you describe the attributes that, you know, someone needs if, to be a very good technical communicator? Well, and, and Richard, I will say that with all the changes I've even seen in my career, um, having that solid foundation of good technical communication skills, it, it has been a constant. Uh, and regardless of the tools and platforms that you're working on, because they're always going to change, they're always going to evolve. Um, it helps to have those solid communication fundamentals, good writing and editing, uh, visual design, um, organization, uh, you know, as, as you referenced, you know, a, a sense of curiosity and inquisitiveness. Um, you have to have good interview skills and observation skills to be able to take information from an expert and translate it into something that a non-expert can understand or use. Um, you know, in when I first started, I spent a lot of time sitting side by side with scientists and engineers watching, asking a lot of questions, um, and, and documenting, capturing what they were doing so that I could translate it into a report or instructions or some other kind of written communication. Today, maybe I'll do some of that research online. Um, maybe I'll go to a search engine. Maybe I'll go to Wikipedia. Um, so there are different ways that we can get some of that information, but the, the basics are still there. Um, you know, you, you have to be willing to do your research. You have to be willing to ask a lot of questions. You have to recognize when you don't have all the answers um, and help fill in some of those gaps. Uh, and, you know, and, and then again, you know, just those solid communication fundamentals, being able to translate all of that information into the, the, the critical points that your user, that your consumer, that your customer uh, really needs to to understand to be able to do what they need to do. So when you when you buy something and it comes with a set of instructions, it comes with certain. Do you critique the guidance that you get when you buy a product or you buy a service? 
I don't necessarily critique the instructions or the manual, but I always take the time to look it over. <laughs> I, I kind of feel like, you know, for me too, not, not only am I um, honoring, you know, my fellow technical communicators and the work that they've done, but, you know, just to look and see um, how others are, are approaching their work, um, you know, in some ways for me, it, it also can be useful. Um, and I certainly have seen a trend uh, in in um, in recent years of fewer words, more pictures, um, and uh, you know, and with the with the trend toward more intuitive design, um, in some cases you can get, I don't know, a new television, a new phone, you know, a new piece of technology, and you don't need a lot of instructions to get going because technical communicators have influenced that design and have helped help to make it more easily usable. Again, it's fascinating. Going back to sort of my early career, I can remember when we didn't have um, computers on the desk and we didn't have laptops. And the first computers came and it had a green screen with a flashing cursor. And and what do you uh-huh. do? <laughs> yeah. And and you would say, yeah. Exactly. And you needed someone to tell you what to do. Yeah. You needed the control or delete or whatever it was to open it and and you just think back to those days and on how poorly served the customer was in that instruction manual unless you went on a training course from the provider and of course all that's gone it's just so more intuitive yeah yeah exactly exactly i mean any more you, you get a new piece of technology and you just look for the power button. You know, you look for the on switch and that's really all you have to do to get started. <laughs> yeah. So as as the president, you know, in your presidential terms, you know, do you have any personal ambitions or goals that you hope to achieve while you're in the role? Well, um, over the past several months, um, I, I became president of STC last May. So my my term you know, is only an, another few months. Um, but what we, what I've been focused on with our board and with the staff for the Society for Technical Communication is continuing to ensure that great programs and resources are available for our members and for other technical communicators who need them, whether it's educational programs or certification, which actually is a partnership between STC and APMG. Um, whether it is connecting with a virtual community of other professionals so that you have contacts that you can bounce ideas off of and, you know, share and, and learn. Um, you know, we're interested in making sure that, that that continues and that we can continue to offer top-notch programs when people need them. Um, we have publications and opportunities to publish. We want to make sure that um, when folks are ready to take their career to the next level, that they have opportunities to be able to do that, whether it's getting information from the publications or even contributing their knowledge and expertise uh, and, and being able you know, to demonstrate that they're contributing in a different way, even beyond you know, their, their day-to-day role, um, adding to the profession, um, adding information that others can use. Um, and I think, you know, while we're celebrating our 70th anniversary this year, you know, that's very exciting. But we also want to make sure that the society is on a solid foundation uh, for the future. We want to be around for at least another 70 years. You, you talk about members contributing. Is it, is, it a, is it a very open group of individuals? Do people volunteer to contribute? Do you have good support from among the members? And, and the members generally reach out and help each other? We, we do have um, wonderful volunteers. We, um, STC is organized in a way that we have an umbrella international society. And then under that, we have some geographically based chapters and also some virtually based, what we call special interest groups, SIGs. And, um, and, what we find is that we have wonderful volunteers who are willing to step up and help lead those communities. But what I see also more and more is in some of those virtual forums, uh, folks are really willing to jump in and help one another. We have a really active Slack channel as one example. 
and we have a number of um, channels set up. You know, we have in within that workspace, and people will be bring their questions, uh, and folks are very willing to share their expertise. Uh, we have a lot of members who are what we would call solo technical communicators. They may be the only person in their organization who does their role. And so within their own company, they don't have a large network to be able to reach out, get some ideas, you know, tap into somebody else's expertise. And so they come to um, STC community and they ask some of those questions, you know, and it, it may be something as simple as um, a usage question. Do you hyphenate? Do you not hyphenate? Is it two words? Is it one word? Um, you know, to more complex questions, where can I find out about knowledge management? My company is moving into a different area that I don't have expertise in. How can I find out about blockchain or, you know, AI or some other kind of technology? And what I've seen is that our, our members are very engaged and they're very willing to jump in and, and help one another, you know, either share their own experiences or maybe point them um, to a place where they can find more detailed knowledge. And, and it's hard to think that empathy and collaboration will ever be replaced by technology. It, exactly. Exactly. You know, again, I can go to a search engine, you know, and, and I can you know, type in, what do I need to know about blockchain? How can I learn about blockchain? It's not the same experience as interacting with a human, you know, even if it's not face-to-face, you know, even if it's through a virtual channel like Slack or or email, it's uh, it's a different experience, you know, getting that feedback, getting that assistance from a person. So, Aisha, you know, 25 years experience in, in the role and doing the job, you know, what do you know now that you would have really loved to have known about 24 years ago as you were starting off in, in this career? You know, what, do you, what would be the one thing that you would have loved to have known back then? I, I will say that for me in my career, when I first started out, um, I was working with a lot of very experienced, very smart um, technical types. Uh, scientists and engineers um, who knew a lot more than I did about the work that they do. And when I first started, I was intimidated by that. Um, It was my role to help interpret what they did and explain it. Um, And I just thought, how am I going to be able to do that? I don't know nearly what they know. Um, And, you know, it, it gets back to kind of those fundamentals of technical communication. Admit it when you don't know it. You know, your role is to help simplify it for others who also don't have expert level expertise. So as a non-expert, I was perfectly positioned to represent that audience. I just didn't realize it. It took me a while to, to, to figure that out. Um, but, you know, my, my advice would be, you know, for, for anyone in the field or considering getting into the field um, is ask a lot of questions. Be inquisitive. Um, Admit when you don't know something. Do the research, but feel free to ask your colleagues a lot of questions. People like it when you show interest in the work that they do. And that's what we need to do as technical communicators, um, is is to be able to understand what, what, um, what the experts do so that we can explain it to people who don't have that same level of expertise. And Looking back on it now, it seems um, it seems like such a simple thing. But again, you know, I was just um, in environments where I was working with people who were so advanced and I was intimidated by it rather than recognizing that I was in the perfect position to be able to do my job um, and and to uh, to help them understand what a non expert view might be. And I was the audience that they were trying to speak to. Um, like I said, it took me a while to get there, but I, but I did. And, and I, I, can, I can understand that. I can empathize with that because I think you forget that you are also an expert mm-hmm. and they are not. So they may be technically very, very expert, but they're hopeless at explaining it to a layperson. <laughs> and you are the expert at explaining it to a layperson. And, and at times we forget that, particularly when we're early on in our careers, 
that we're in the room because of our expertise. Well, and that's an excellent point, Richard. Yes, that I and I sometimes still today, um, I forget that. Um, and and it's it's gratifying to have colleagues say, oh, I never would have thought of that or help me for looking at that in a different way um, or or to have maybe difficult customers. Um, I, I have worked with people over the years who weren't necessarily happy about working with a communicator who said, you know, I I'm a good writer. I'm a good speaker. I don't need your assistance. Um, and be and you know working with someone and then having them come back later and asking for advice or asking, um, it, you know, if I would look at something that they have written. It's um, it, it's nice to have that expertise acknowledged. Aisha, fascinating talking to you, and once again, congratulations on the society's seventieth birthday. Is there any particular message that you have for people who? see technical communication as a career? You know, should they reach out directly to the society or through one of the regional groups or the, uh, the special groups? I, I would encourage anyone who has an interest in technical communication, whether they're already working in the field or whether they're looking to break into the field, visit us at stc.org. Uh, that's our website. And um, that's a great place to start to learn about the offerings, the benefits, the resources uh, that we can provide you to help you continue to advance and develop or even maybe get into a new career field. Many, many thanks, Aisha. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Richard. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. We're always keen to hear your feedback and suggestions for future episodes. You can find all the information in the show notes below. Please visit apmg international.com to find out more about our accredited training and the certifications that support them that are related to the topics discussed in this series. I hope you've enjoyed today and I look forward to you joining future episodes while we continue our exploration into best practice and the benefits it brings to global business. Thank you.